Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Yan Bar Podcast. My name is Brian Barcello, host of this episode. Today's guest, ha, we got the author of Cajun Delectables, 100 Cajun Family Recipes. And the author is L.D. Sledge. L.D., thank you so much for doing this podcast. Hey, this looks like it's going to be fun, Brian. Yes, sir. Hey, check this out. Um, as agreed upon, if my memory serves me correctly, we want to um, start off with um, your book, of course, uh, The Origins of This Great Cuisine. I figured that would be a great way to start off, and then in there, we can touch on whatever else, you know, we decide to talk about. Okay. All right. You know, to, I mean, take it I'm, away. I, I, I'm overflowing with information about all this, and I can talk about it. So, uh, the, the, where did it come from? Okay, uh, you might get ready for a little dissertation here. I'll talk for a minute, and it's okay. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it was in 1545, and there was, a, there was an Italian explorer going up the East Coast, and he got up into where's Canada right now and Nova Scotia in that area. He thought it was so beautiful, he called it Arcadia, which means a place of paradise or some ideal beautiful land. And then, um, <clears throat> so that's Arcadia. And then later on, the Canadians uh, mapped it and, and they forgot the R. And they left the R out. And so it become Acadia. Okay, so that so the so before that, in about 1600, the French fishermen found that it was such great fishing, they started fishing in that area and moving back and forth to France. And what happened was they built a colony there, and for and then then they had a country, and they built it and they had it beautiful land and cleared land and cleared swamps and had fishing and hunting. They were just hunters and fishermen, simple people that bartered with the Indians and so on. And uh, so they had their own country like for a hundred years, but they were still loyal to France. And then the English came along and uh, okay, of course they had their own food they cooked and they cooked it out of the land, you know, they caught it and they cooked it and they, whatever. So English came along, the English were at war with uh, France. And th there was a colonel by the name of Lawrence, who was evidently a real bad guy. And he said, you know, we want to have our English people come here uh, and uh, get this choice land. And the Cajuns, Cajuns, as you can imagine, Acadian, Cajun, See, it got translated <laughs> over like that. Anyway, the Cajuns uh, were Catholic. And Lawrence said, you change your religion to the Ch Church of England, and you uh, pledge allegiance to the church, to my country. They said, no, we ain't doing that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a big conflict for quite a number of years now. They had cleared the land, they had the choice land, so Lawrence says, that's it. I think it was 17, I forgot what year it was, uh, 1700 something, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but um, Yeah. So they were at war and it was 1755, it's whenever. So they said, get out. And these people were just, you know, they, they, they weren't doing any harm, but, but Lawrence wanted to land. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And learned later that he was going to do this anyway. So he, he put in the middle of the night, they have a thing in England, I mean, in, uh, up there in the uh, Nova Scotia area, they call the night of the long rifles. When they went into these houses and split up families and sent them out and divided children from their parents and put them on boats, they were cargo boats, not fit for humans. Mm -hmm. And they took about 10,000 of them into boats. It was a, it's called Le Grand Dérangement. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which is uh, is as bad as the Holocaust. Anyway, it was a terrible thing. And they sent them out of there. There was a few stayed around. A number of them went off and hid in the woods. But there were a lot of them got sent like that. And um, so during this time, they were scattered all over the place. And a number of them went into Louisiana. The Spanish had the Louis had Louisiana control. So during that time, the ownership of the Louisiana went back from Spanish to French to Spanish to French. And they had it at that time. And they wanted some of the diligent, hardworking people to come and uh, occupy Louisiana. So they did. Now, that is the... Um, that is the... Um, origin of the Cajun people in Louisiana. Now, the food came from the forest, the waters. You know, they, they made their own recipes, their own diet. And this is, doesn't come from any other country. It comes from what they made. They could grow themselves or kill and feed themselves. So that is the source of the food. But the Louisiana is kind of semi-tropical. So it's an ideal scene to grow spices and stuff. And of course, they had no refrigeration, so they needed to have a way to preserve it. And spices is a way to preserve a lot of food. So they had their own foods. And it's like, uh, it's to me, I found that so few people knew that anything about Cajun or Cajun cooking, they said that Cajun is hot. It's definitely not hot. You can make it hot as you want it. Mm -hmm. But it's like Cajun food is uh, very flavorful. And I'll tell you in a minute how it gets that way. But that's the source of Cajuns. And, and their food comes from the forest and the land and the, the waterways and so on. Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's the source of the Cajun. Yeah, and one thing um, that's interesting and um, tragic at the same time is a shame people had to go through that. Um, I know reading um, later on in the book, I want to jump ahead so much, um, the people actually left Nova Scotia and traveled by foot, I believe, down towards Louisiana. That and was a good number of them that was so desperate. They walked from Canada through the wilderness to get to Louisiana. Incredible. And that's walking. And, you know, it was wild country. There wasn't any civilization. And it, uh, quite a number, maybe a thousand of them did it over time. And um, they wanted to go someplace. And what they did, they founded a country for themselves in Louisiana mm -hmm. uh, that was better than Canada mm -hmm. when they got here. But it was hard. They've had a hard time. Yeah, I imagine the swamps down there, mosquitoes and, and the gators, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've hunted and fished in all that country, and I'll tell you what. Yeah, they got mosquitoes that about you through your hat. Whoa. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Okay>. incredible. <laughs> now, now, the cooking um, that, um, might be bouncing around a bit. The um, one thing I noticed, right, when um, the cooking, it seemed like um, you were talking about cast iron. And yeah. no aluminum. What's going on with aluminum? Well, not Alzheimer or anything, oh, right? No, no, no. <laughs> aluminum will give off toxics, toxicity. Yeah, don't cook it unless you have to. Just throw all your aluminum stuff away. It's stainless steel or, uh, or, 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 or the cast? Cast iron, yeah. Yeah, so stainless is okay then, but preferably yeah, cast iron. Of course, they didn't have stainless steel in those days. They just had cast iron. Cast iron was a easy to get and easy to make and it'll last forever and when you season it that is you can put some oil on it mm -hmm. and uh, put it in the oven and cook it for a while and then clean it and put oil on it again and put it back in the oven and it comes out almost stick proof it's wow. uh you know it, yeah. food, food won't necessarily stick in it you know? yeah I thought that was fascinating when I was reading that in your book. Um, that's something I had never heard about. I know um, when you would wipe your pants when you're done, they always they clean them. So I put a little coating of grease on it afterwards. But I never knew that you prepared the pants like that in the beginning. So yeah, I, I, that's, yeah. that's the way to season it. 
Uh, and so when you buy one, sometimes it'll say pre-season. I mean, it, well, it won't be too much, but you can cook on it. But you just take your your oil and but whenever you get through and you wash it, don't 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 use steel wool because you cut through it. So you just wash it, and, and if you need to leave it sit for a while and let the food dissolve and then wash it, do that, and then put a little coat of oil on it mm-hmm. and, and put it back in the shelf, and it'll stay good you know, till the next time. That's incredible. Yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with them, cast iron cookware, particularly the skillets and stuff. You know, grew up with them, and everybody, I'm really using them to cook cornbread. You know, they do chicken and other things like that, too, but mainly they'll make cornbread in it and stuff, right? Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, one thing, um, as I'm getting up there in the years and stuff, you know, I have to um, keep watch my diet. Um, in particular, sugars. And um, in particular, it, what? what's the word? I'm sorry, sugars. Yeah, okay. in particular, sugars. So I, and I was curious and stuff. Um, when it comes to Cajun cooking, um, I'm noticing the book it mentioned gluten, and then another thing. Um, what about the sweet dishes and stuff? You know, so people who are that's what I'm saying. People who are concerned about their diet. How does this work in with Cajun cooking? Well, that's a problem. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, if you are vegan. Uh, you got to do it out the meat. And so you can do that. That's pretty easy. Being uh, uh, gluten-free is another thing. Your flour, you're going to have flour in a lot of your meals, you know, and these soups and stuff. You're going to put flour. And any other thing like that, sugar-free, uh, you can try to use uh, artificial sugars and stuff, but uh, it, it just doesn't have the same chemical response that... Uh, sugar does Mm -hmm. so you know when you do uh, look at these recipes if it's got sugar in it or flour in it it will be against your religion uh and bacon (laughs) so So, you know uh you're you're in trouble because uh, but that's that's why i give a little caveat a warning in the beginning i said if you're in all of that you're in a in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah, there's um, yeah, um, there's a lot of folks. Um, you know, they have um, let's say dietary restrictions. So yeah. um, and that's that's with any type of food, I guess. So you know, no knock or Cajun cooking. Now, for um, those of us, sorry for the guys who perhaps can't enjoy it, but for those of us who can, <laughs> you know, I'm saying, um, just asking you, um, right off, do you have a favorite dish that you like to eat? And or prepare? Oh, of course. It's got to be how you, your mood, you know. I mean, sometimes I might like a gumbo. Sometimes I'd like to. Have, well, recently mm-hmm. I cooked uh, a friend of mine who um, made my, my uh, landing page. The landing page is Cajun cookingsecrets.com, CajunCookingSecrets.com. He's kind of a genius. And he says, you know, I, I, I'll, I get paid in food. <laughs> <laughs> I say, you got it, man. And so I, I paid him part of it, but I mean, that's the, what I put up there. Anyway, uh, I cooked him pork chop and green beans. Mm-hmm. And, and I cooked him some potatoes and gave it to him. Now, that pork chop, I, I'll tell you about that. And I'm going to tell you about the green beans now. That this is my recipe. And I got to tell you, it's, it's bad good, man. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, as they say in Louisiana, slap your mama good. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say it make a bulldog break his chain. Anyway. The, you take that pork chop. Here's something people don't know about. Mm-hmm. Is you take a tenderizer. I'll be right back. I'm going to show you something. All right. This is so cool. Oh, man. 
Can't wait to try out some of these recipes myself. Matter of fact, I got a bag of shrimp. I'm not going to tell them that they're frozen because it might be sacrilegious, but I have some frozen shrimp in there and um, we got some other ingredients and I can't wait to try out one of these dishes. Matter of fact, um, when LD get back, we're going to ask them about the, um, the Holy Trinity and stuff of the foods. And these are like the main ingredients. It's like what you start off with um, to do Cajun cooking. So this is going to be fantastic. And got so many great things to ask them. Matter of fact, this book, the book on um, that LD, LD yeah. um, wrote. Here we go. Oh, there you go. All right, LD's back. Uh, I was yeah, talking to everybody while he's gone. That's okay. Whenever you have a piece of meat, now this applies to steaks mm -hmm. as well as pork chop. Okay. Okay. But you take, see, I've got a little hammer. Uh huh. And I got this bad boy here. Ooh. Oh, never so seen you, that before. Yeah, don't sit on that. <laughs> <laughs> so you just take it, you know, and bump, bump, bump all over the steak, all over it, and you beat it. With this now, what the reason for that is the steak uh, or this pork chop has fibers, and these fibers are tough. It breaks the fibers down, and it makes them makes the meat tender. Now, I don't stop at that. Uh -oh. After I beat the hell out of it, then what I do is I take it and I put it put uh, soda that is bicarbonate of soda. I just put it on it, spread it all over it put it in a, in a uh, plastic bag, put it in the refrigerator for a while, mm -hmm. an hour, overnight, whatever, and then I take it out, and then I wash that off. Now, we're good to go. It's good and tender. Hmm. Now, I do something else that's a little different. I've already now chopped up my garlic. Now, let me tell you, I take some butter. The more butter, the better. Okay. And... Uh, if you put it in your skillet and it melts, it'll burn if you're not careful. But what you do is put a little oil in that butter and it'll stop it from burning. Okay. You need to know that. Mm -hmm. So then Great there you it. go with that. So now you got it going. Now you've chopped up your, you saute your, um, <clears throat> you saute your uh, garlic in there until you got it real uh, mixed up real good. Now, here's the difference. You take a couple of tablespoons of brown sugar oh. and mix that up in there with that. Okay. Now, you might take some Cajun seasoning just a little bit and put it in there or some or one of the cayenne, but just, uh, just a little. And you mix that up with it. Now, you put that uh, pork chop in there and you cook it until it's, uh, it's still got a little pink in it, and you make sure you flip it over, of course, and it, it'll sort of cook for itself, even with a little pink in it, after you take it out, if you take it out. Now you've got something that slap your mama good, right there. <laughs> I love right that there. expression. I hope people will just understand. That occasion would say, man, that's bad, bad good, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> LD. Now, one yeah. thing, my fault. Um, I wanted you to mention the the, the Trinity, the Trinity. The one, yeah, the Trinity. I'm, gonna come, I'm gonna come around to that. All right, okay. Right, take it down. okay. Anyway, I want to tell you about another favorite recipe, real quick, about okay. green, green beans. Take them green beans, and of course, you cut the ends off and everything, and you boil them a little bit until they almost they don't get them cooked, but just tenderize them a little bit, mm -hmm. and then. I take the skillet and I do the same thing with the butter, the oil, and sugar. And see, that's that's why I'm saying I'm anathema to these other guys who went to all those diets and stuff when right. I put the sugar in there. Anyway, I put that sugar in the skillet and I put some, what the hell? Um, well, I just went blank, um, which oh, is, right. this is what makes it do. Curry. I take a tablespoon of curry mm -hmm. and put it in there with that sugar and with a little heat, a uh, little cayenne or a little something, okay? And then I cook those beans in that. And when it, it is amazing, 
It's mm. really, people are shocked. They say, what's that seasoning? Okay, there's that one. That's another one. Okay, now we have to tell you about the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, um, you see people do this with gumbo. Gumbo is, uh, well, I'll tell you about the history of gumbo. That's not what we're talking about here. But to make gumbo, mm -hmm. you need to have like a lot of, a lot of the Cajun foods are stews and soups. And that's, of course, you have something like pork chops and stuff on one side and the seafood in another way. But there's a way to cook these. And, and nearly every country had something similar to thicken the, um, the soup. You know? Okay. So what they do is they take, um, is you take, um, I was trying to tell you about something else. You know, I was about to jump over. But you take the take a cup of oil mm -hmm. and a cup of flour mm -hmm. and you stir it and you mix it mm -hmm. and you stir it and you stir it and you stir it and you stir it and you stir it. And you finally get to oh well, golly, and you turn it to a golden brown, but for a few little black spots pop up in there, you burn it and start over. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got something else that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, my son, Tom, who uh, likes to cook Cajun too, but he thinks I'm some kind of a traitor because I don't, I shortcut. I get to, I, I go to Amazon mm -hmm. and get some already made root. Uh -huh. And you just put some, a couple of spoonfuls and this and that and some water and stuff. Now you've got a roommate. You don't have to stir it that long. Mm -hmm. you know? But it's a thickener. It's already there. And the flavor's there. It's good. It's fine. Now, what you do, you've got that in your pot now. you got it. Uh, you got your basic down there. Now, the Holy Trinity uh -huh. is onion, celery, and bell pepper. Mm -hmm. And it depends on your recipe, what you're doing. It might be uh, uh, one bell pepper chopped up, one uh, a couple of sticks of celery chopped, and then uh, maybe a couple of onions. And you chop all that up. They call that the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. And then you have garlic. Garlic uh, got religion, mm -hmm. and it joined the church, and it goes in the soup with them. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, that's my own silliness. So what they what it does is you take that together and now you saute it in that roux. Mm -hmm. And now you got it flavor and you can just smell that kitchen is smelling so good. You say, mm -hmm. what is that? Mm -hmm. Now here's what now that's your base. Mm -hmm. And and then you put your um I I found doing a gumbo. I will take some uh, beef stock or some chicken stock instead of water. A lot of people just use water. Of course, old mama back at home, she'd use water. She never even heard of chicken stock necessarily. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I'd put that. It gives a, a, better, a better taste overall. Then you put your meat and your uh, and the vegetables, whatever else you want to put in it, and um, cook that down. Mm -hmm. See, that's my... Uh, that's my uh, logo. It's a little crawfish in a pot that says, cook it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, let's see, where is it, where is it here? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. They cook it yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there you go. So that's the deal with uh, those. And mm -hmm. you can... Um, but if you put seafood in there, any shrimp, make sure you cook it after. I mean, in other words, you got everything else cooked pretty well. And the last 15 minutes or so, put the shrimp in there because it will get real tough if you don't. Ah, matter of fact, that's what I'm going to attempt to cook today. Um, I have um, some ingredients and I'm going to find something in your book that you did with shrimp. So I'm going to try to cook something today, you know, with shrimp in it and stuff. And that's a good tip. A lot of times I cooked shrimp before and it was rubbery. So I think I overcooked it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like you mentioned, yeah. You know, another thing I noticed on three books, it seemed like um, just about every dish starts with the roux. I don't know if all of them do, but it just seems like every dish starts with the roux. And then, yeah. like you said, yeah, and then you come in with the trinity. And, uh, and I love that. I said, I, I think I can handle that, you know. Well, you ask a Cajun how you cook that, and he'll say, first you make a roux. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say, first you make a roux. And you do this, and then you cook it down. <laughs> I love the accent. <laughs> I love the uh, accent. You know, my, my ex-wife lived in Thibodeau, mm -hmm. and uh, and her, of course, she was Cajun. I mean, totally. Mm -hmm. And uh, and her daughters married Cajuns, of course. And I asked him. He's a rather hefty boy, mm -hmm. and he knew how to cook. He knew all those people know how to cook. Mm -hmm. And every time I'd ask him how to cook something, he'd say, you do this and that, and then you cook it down. Uh, that means you, you, you cook it down. You cook it down. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, reading a book and in the ingredients, um, and, you know, they took various stuff from the land, you know, they ate from the land. It reminded me, sure, it was way more delicious, but it reminded me of, uh, what was it called? Rock soup. You know how people just came by. You ever hear the story rock soup? And people um, came by and they added various ingredients. Yeah. Do you remember that story? <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, try I'm trying to remember that. Well, yeah, um, just real quick. Um, basically, what it was um, somebody had just had a pot of water yeah. and didn't have anything to put in it. And somebody put a rock in to get it started. Yeah, that was a rock soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rock soup. And then everybody else come and they brought whatever they had. And then, <laughs> you know, you had the delicious um, super stew afterwards. And I just thought about all of the ingredients that people um, were adding in there. You know, things that, you know, they lived off the land. And um, from what I understand, the land at the time was super abundant. I don't know how it is now. And uh, so, yeah, that's pretty good. And uh, one thing I noticed on reading your book, it said that it didn't have beef. No, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, it's one thing about the gumbo I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I've kind of told you how to make a gumbo already with the roux, and then uh, that was the mm -hmm. recipe for for a gumbo. Um, the thing is that Mama would cook your gumbo on Monday, and they'd eat it all week. Oh, wow! That was, that was whenever your gumbo throw everything in the pot that's left over. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you cook it, and you cook it down, and cook it down. You know, <laughs> then next thing you know, you've got soup, and you got rice, and it's always got rice, and it's got you mix that, and you got a nutritious thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you just mentioned what was that you just mentioned? I'm sorry, I got off track. Oh, just on rock soup. Oh, it just reminded me of rock soup when you're cooking um, the various ingredients yeah. that went in. And I noticed that um, in the book you mentioned that they didn't have beef. You know, yeah, when I thought beef. about it, like, of course, yeah, they probably have cows running around. Yeah. No, no, they just didn't. And they, they had cows, but they mm -hmm. didn't raise them for beef. Uh, uh, they they did use them for milk and butter and stuff. But that was what that was. If they, didn't, uh, they didn't have, in those days, they didn't have any cattle they had pigs and hogs mm -hmm. and they had a la boucherie which they would butchery they would cub they would butcher the hogs and there'd be a big celebration and they would eat there there was something in there i put in there called uh, anyway they would take the baby pig uh and and they'd split him up and then they'd put him on a big wire and then they would have a fire underneath it Mm -hmm. And they would cook that overnight and cook and cook and cook. And it's the most delicious tasting stuff you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. it's amazing. Anyway, but that's what they would do. They would, uh, and they would eat a lot of, most all of the pig. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they would, they didn't waste anything. Yeah, understood. Um, chitlins, I don't know. Yeah, do you know anything about chitlins? Yeah, they had chickens. That, that's one thing: chickens and eggs. And no, I'm, talk, I'm talking about chitlins, the intestines, and what? from the pig, the um, from the pig intestines, the chitlins. Oh, chitlins! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, chitlins, uh, chitlins is the uh, intestines of mm -hmm. the animal. Yeah, and, and uh, I've had. I don't think I had much of anything about chitlins in the book, but. Mm -mm, I, I didn't had them, and uh -huh. I was uh, not my favorite because 
<laughs> right. It's no, I understand lower, completely. It's the lower intestine. And, <laughs> yeah. And you got to make sure it's pretty well cleaned up for Super you. clean, yeah. Yeah, I don't like the way it um fills a house with aroma. I'm not, I don't care for yeah. that one either. Yeah, <laughs> but they, they ate it. They ate it, yeah. and it was nutritious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got noticed you said they didn't waste anything. You know, from the pig, I said, oh, that means they was eating some chitlins and stuff. Wow, yeah. that's cool. Now, um, oh, one one cool quote um in your book, um, I love. You got a lot of good things in there. You says there's only two places to live, and they said that's New Orleans, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so somewhere else, something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, now New Orleans is a totally different type of thing. It's uh, I lived in New Orleans, mm -hmm. French Quarter, for several years. I was mm -hmm. practicing law with a firm there. Mm -hmm. And I was traveling all over Louisiana, putting water systems, highways and stuff in, financing it and put it in. And did that for a long time. And then I moved to Baton Rouge and set my office up there. But mm -hmm. uh, therefore, I was able to uh, learn about a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. as I traveled around, you know. Wow. And, and so... Um, where was I headed with that? I forgot where I was going. There. Well, I was talking about that um, quote in your book about um, two places. Um, there's only oh, two yeah. places to live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> there is, uh, and it's really true, mm -hmm. that a thoroughbred New Orleanian mm -hmm. would say there's only two places to live, and that's New Orleans and someplace totally ridiculous. Right, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, man. You meet somebody from New Orleans, you know, they're sort of like Californians, you know. Mm -hmm. They feel like there's no place to live except someplace like California. Understood. And New Yorkers, they got the same thing going. Yeah. On. Now, <laughs> now, LD, tell me something. Well, let me tell you this first. When I was in Florida, I ran across um couple of people that was from New Orleans. Now, the thing is, I asked him, it was a man and a lady, I asked the guy, I said, where are you from? And he said, Nolens. I said, what? He said, Nolens. <laughs> and I was still looking at it. He said, Nolens, man. And so then I asked the lady, she said, um, New Orleans. Or she might have, so what's the pronunciation? Is it New Orleans, New Orleans? <laughs> Um, or New Orleans, <laughs> how he said it. I, you know. yeah, I've got a, a little section in the book on that about, see, anybody that don't know nothing about New Orleans, mm -hmm. they're going to say, I'm from New Orleans, or I'm from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Wrong, man. Wrong. That's bad. Mm -hmm. well, if you're from New Orleans, if you say New Orleans. New mm -hmm. Orleans. Now, if you're from uptown in the Silk Stocking area, up in the Garden area, mm -hmm. you say New Orleans. New Orleans. Uh oh. I'm sorry. I got company. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Welcome edition. <laughs> hey, LD, you know what? While we're on this topic, like I said, there's so much about. Um, New, um, how you say it, New Orleans? <laughs> um, there's so much that I didn't know. And I'm sure a lot of people are the same way. There's new, um, Louisiana, that state, is comprised of very different areas. Mm -hmm. Could uh -huh. you touch on that? And perhaps what's the, the best dishes they're known for? You know, the um, dishes they're known for. Well, I'll show you. Okay, I don't know where you can see this. Right there, yeah, perfect. Okay. Now, 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 if you can, I'm going to not hold it too long, but okay. uh, in the uh, top part, northern Louisiana, the, and in the middle, central Louisiana, mm -hmm. now you have Acadia. Now, look how big Acadia is. Wow. Acadia covers the entire heel of the boot all the way to New Orleans. And then there's a little section above the toe of the boot, and it's called Florida. It's called English Florida, and then there's New Orleans. So... Oh. So then the thing is that uh, in northern Louisiana mm -hmm. and in central Louisiana, it's sort of like the viewpoint and also the accent is similar to like all the way across southern Louisiana. It's like uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's not as severe because once you hear Alabama and Georgia, it's like Jimmy Carter would say this, you know, that's the way to talk, you know. Yeah. Uh, but now they're they're not like that per se, but you can the, the 
country music today is what they've got, the accent. It's like you hear. Uh, oh, the draw? Like such uh, draws? It, it's, it, it's got a draw, you know, like that. It looks like, like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to open up a can of whoop ash and whoop, <laughs> you know, uh, that kind of thing. You know, right. that's where they talk. Uh, and, and except over in the Texas border, it gets a little bit more Texified. Uh, and it's uh, not quite as country sounding as that, but it's still that way. But it's all the way across Texas now. When I was growing up, there was no particular accent there, but it just got real strong in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, now whenever you get into South Louisiana and you go to New Orleans, mm -hmm. people are surprised because when they get down there, um, they go... They just stop at a restaurant downtown in the quarter or something. Mm -hmm. and, and they hear some people talking like, hey, uh, I got in the court today and I went down and made a turn at that last boulevard down and made a turn. <laughs> like the, the, the warm turns, you know, <laughs> yeah. the way, just like in Brooklyn. Uh, that's the way they talk. And uh, that's in part of the town, or most of the town. Mm -hmm. They call that yet speak. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and the yes. yes comes from where you at. And that means how you doing. Oh, and not actually a location. They want to know how, how you are. Yeah. Where and of at? course, when you go over, you get over into Cajun land, you got another thing altogether. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, their accent is, uh, I've, I've got all this accent in the book. They got some things that they say this. One is C H E R, shaft. Sha, mm -hmm. you say Sha. I'm going down. You say uh, me. I, uh, well, that's some nice thing there, Sha. You know, it's just a term of endearment, and they throw that in Sha. You know, and I've I've say that a lot of times, but uh, and then the other one is May M A I S, um, and that means but translated in French, but it means basically well all right then uh like that that starts a sentence they say uh made that some good gumbo that made that some good gumbo man that's a uh i boy it, it may it is hot hot today uh and they sell start the sentence with me you know <laughs> and, and they say stuff like that you know and uh well, you know, the Cajuns are such hilarious people. I mean, I mean, they're serious. They're ward workers. Uh, they're different from other people, and I wish people know more about them. And the reason I wrote this book is because I want people to know about Cajuns. I love them. Uh, they, they're not politically correct. They don't, ah. give it, they don't care, you know. <laughs> I mean, but they do care. Mm -hmm. And they're, most, they're all Catholic. They have a great life. They, uh, I'll tell you more about it in a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, when they they have uh, they they say you know laissez le bon temps rouler, let the good time roll. Yeah, that's the way their life is. You know, they got dance. They love to dance. They love to eat good food. Like they, they dance at funerals. I uh, think I've seen that, you know, on television, I've never seen it, but I think they have funerals where they have, um, you know, like, it seems like a big festival or something, you know, some kind of funeral, you know, people marching down the street and they're dancing and singing. Yeah, yeah they've got, Louisiana has festivals all the time. Wow. I miss that so much. I mean, when I was, even in Baton Rouge, when I was in Baton Rouge, they had about four or five festivals a year. Wow. I mean, they had a festival uh, at, uh, of course, Mardi Gras, it's big. Uh, uh, but they would have a festival for St. Patrick's Day or Christmas, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Cajun country, they had crawfish festivals and all kinds of festivals, a lot more in the Cajun country. Wow. But oh, you mentioned May. crawfish. Uh, about May, I was, uh -huh. uh, the, the word May, mm -hmm. I was uh, on a plane coming into a little town, uh, the center, center of Cajun country one day. And I was sitting next to a girl who was on the border, uh, the board of the, uh, I don't know whether she was in, in ranking in some kind of thing in the city. Mm -hmm. And she said, 
do you know how a Cajun baby cry? And I said, how's that? She said, he go, he go, me, why? <laughs> me, why? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Oh, my goodness. Now, you mentioned the word um, crawfish. Let me see. When I grew up, yeah, we call them crawdads. Crawfish, crawdads. Um, anyway, and another one is crayfish. I noticed you have mentioned in a book. Um, what do you got a preference? Well, let me tell you about crawdads and crawfish. They, they got uh, some idea up in the Yankee country. You know, mm -hmm. north, where you from? Uh, by my way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have a thing called crawfish, but they mm -hmm. call them crawdads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's a little old anemic looking thing. You know, mm -hmm. he's, you find him in the creeks and stuff and use him for fish bait. Mm -hmm. Good bait, you know. Yeah. Anyway, but when you get down to lose mm -hmm. what you got, you got a, you can have one that long. Oh you no know, way! That big, they're like the best. The best tasting ones are about about that long. You know, about three, four inches. Wow! Uh, and uh, you just but but you know that's you can find them in the ditches. Uh, you can find them uh, in uh, the swamps. You can find them in the pond. Some people raise them, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and they they mix it up in the, say in the rice fields. They'll have a crawfish, they'll raise crawfish in the rice field. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, a lot of water in the patties. A lot of water, you know. Yeah. It's a, and they have a little what, a P roll, a little flat boat, and, and they take him and you go and you have these nets. Mm -hmm. The net has, uh, say, two wires that come down like that, and they hook to a net, and you put a chicken neck in there. And you drop it in the water, and you have a string of them, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of them, and you just paddle along. And you take that post, a little stick, pitch it up, dump your crawfish in there, and mm -hmm. come back, back, they're back in there again when you come back through, you know. Wow. So that's, that's the way, they, and that's for, for now they do uh, commercial, and they have a better, more sophisticated. Uh, system than that but that's mm -hmm. the way you do it and you got them free i mean they had sometimes in the spring the ditches would be filled with uh, water and they'd be filled with crawfish i'd take my kids out there I had two sons and i'd to go out there and we would they, they love doing that more than anything you know? wow yeah. take a stick and pick, pick up them crawfish and put them in there and you come back home and put them in the pot and mm -hmm. boil them up yeah it seems seems like you prefer the word um Crawfish. Do people on um, they go back and forth to cray the crawdads or just crawfish or the name is just yeah. Well, you know, he's a crawfish. He's not a crawdad or crayfish. <laughs> he's not that. No, none of those. Those are little, <laughs> just, they're little weenies, you know. Really. Oh, I see. So it's the size. <laughs> so the ones that approach lobster <laughs> size, the bigger ones, those are the crawdads. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, they're all they're all kin. They just a little little sad cousin to North, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to catch them at this lake I have nearby. They're under stones and I move the stones from you know in the water and you see yeah. them swimming backwards and I put a cup there to catch them and stuff, you know. <laughs> didn't, didn't eat them or anything. I just thought they were cool to mess with. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure they didn't agree. <laughs> but anyway, um yeah there's something else um oh when we was talking about um Louisiana a lot of people self-included, according to the book, seem to um, think that um, New Orleans, I, I'm trying to get this right. Like you're saying that um, New, New Orleans, Orleans. No, no, New Orleans, how you say it? New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. Okay, I got to I gotta oh, work on New Orleans. I got to work on that. <laughs> now, New Orleans isn't Cajun. Now, I always oh. thought it was, but no. it's not. Man, you no. clear that up? <laughs> Man, no, that ain't no Cajun. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. There's, there, there's New Orleans is, a, is an island. To me, it's an island, totally different culture 
than Cajun or any other place in the planet. Wow. And it is a, a, a town, a city that has not moved into the current of time. It just don't move. It's just like it was many years ago. And uh, it's always retained its personality. And New Orleans originally was inhabited. They were the first people in Louisiana that were French. And they came here thinking the aristocrats, thinking that it was wealthy and they could move in here and they had fortune made. They realized that New Orleans area and the area of New Orleans, the, on the Mississippi there, was uh, just a mosquito swamp. Mm. Now, I'll show you here in the book. I don't know if we'd be able to make it out or not. But there is the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And it's a big curve, see? It's a crescent. Right. Crescent and they city. call that the Crescent City. Mm -hmm. Now, then up above that, you see there is, uh, now that's the Mississippi below, and that's Lake Pontchartrain over here on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, New Orleans is below sea level, and it, it's protected by, by, um, it's protected by levee system. Yeah. yeah, and that's what happened during Katrina, because Katrina, the levees broke, and it flooded the town so much, and that's what all the destruction was, and that's what destroyed this, that part of the Louisiana at that time, but it's back, I understand now, it's been doing well. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so New Orleans as a culture, Mm -hmm. has a, even a couple of cultures within it. Now, I wondered why when I first started hearing the talk of, you know, say, uh, say, uh, yeah, that's good. I don't know, I could try to copy it, you know, <laughs> like the, but it was like, I, I couldn't believe it sounded like Brooklyn. You know, oh, people really? come in and they sound, think it sounds like Brooklyn. You know, the warm times. Um, and but yet it's retained its its uh, basic feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it was originally French, pure French, mm -hmm. uh, and that's different from uh, uh, Cajuns because it's not Cajun at all. It's different. The food was a basic continental cuisine. Cajun mm -hmm. comes out of the swamps and the waters and so on. It's all natural. This was something else that had a different attitude a different viewpoint completely only during the last 30 40 years has uh cajun sort of injected itself into the cuisine in new orleans and they started taking some of the recipes and eat and the fancy restaurants and they've become very popular mm -hmm. uh so that's new orleans and it's not cajun it's not the food is not hot they're totally different people uh, all together. They don't have the, because see what happened was that whenever the Grand Le Derangement, when they were in Holocaust and they were kicked out, they, a lot of them went to New Orleans thinking that they could find refuge. So these very sophisticated hoity toity blue collar, silk socking, didn't want anything to do with these fishermen and, you know, regular old people. And so they didn't find a home there. They didn't welcome them. They basically said, now nah, you go someplace else. Mm. And that's what happened. So Cajun, now the word Creole, you've mm. heard the word Creole. They say Creole cooking. It's, it's similar to Cajun cooking. Uh, the only difference is that there's a um, uh, seasoning. It's not as spicy. If you want to make a big distinction between the two, mm. Cajun is more spicy. And, and uh, Creole has its own uh, spices, but it has, you can spice it up too. Yeah. But the word Creole basically means uh, when you have like the French people moved into New Orleans, mm -hmm. the uh, children of that person is called a Creole. Mm -hmm. In other words, when the child is born of the people of the original uh, French, Mm -hmm. Now, that child is a Creole. He's mm -hmm. still French, but he's called a Creole. Now, you have uh, another type of Creole. 
Now, that was the original Creole in Louisiana. Now, as the French moved on into the southwest part of the state toward Texas, mm -hmm. then there was a mingling of Spanish, French, Indian, and Black. So they have become, that is the new Creole in that part of the country. So when you hear Creole music, mm -hmm. it is that music. Oh, like Kid Creole in the Coconuts? I don't know if you remember yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like a different thing altogether, you yeah. know? And uh, so you got three kinds of Creole. Mm. That's, a, that's a difference. Yeah, I know this um, going backwards just a little bit. The Mitz, I think they were called the Mitz people. And it says some, they were um, made from um, various people, almost just like the Creole people in a sense. I think they were called the Mitz people, the ones that was up in Nova Scotia. I think yeah, that those number. are. Yeah, I forgot about putting that in there. There was um, now how, what's how do you spell? Oh, I'm sorry, Metis people, the Metis people, French, Canadian, and Indians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, see, thus, if you would, mm -hmm. the, I see, I never heard too much about that in my mm -hmm. life, but it, it popped up in my research and here. Ah. I, I never was. You never even use the word or anything like that in normal life that I knew of. But I'd read a lot, and I'm a reader, I read a lot about Canada and that part of the country up in, mm -hmm. uh, there was um, the fur traders up there, uh, they mixed with the Indians. Mm -hmm. And that was those people. Ah, that was a mix of the, the races uh, there. And that was, those. they were like, pretty they're hardy people they were tough people because mm -hmm. they were born of the people who moved up there and they became mixed mm -hmm. and that was it yeah that yeah a lot that, of, yeah. I watch a lot of programs on um you know ancient civilizations and I always look at the migrations patterns and it seems like neighboring countries or civilizations seem like they always mix and they tend to form a different people in a sense, or a new type of people. I notice I see that reoccurring, you know, coming up a lot. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. you got a, fam a famous um, author um, besides yourself, another famous um, writer there, Longfellow. What was his name? Um, Henry Wadsworth. Came up with a really cool um, um, poem, I believe, about the area. Now, wasn't Evangeline? You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, well, you see, when that, the, when the Le Grand Derangement was taking place, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, you know, they were like, it was brutal. I mean, they didn't have anybody to resist at all. And here these people were, and nobody knew how to speak their language. And it wasn't written. Uh, and even, it went even further over the next few hundred years, whenever they were in Louisiana. Here's a language that was created locally. Uh, through their uses and idioms, and they, they found a good way to say something, they put it in their language, you know. So there was never anything at all like that. So, um, so what happened was that whenever wait, wait, I don't know where I was headed again, I got That's I Longfellow. thinking about something else. Here. Yeah, that was my fault. I'm bouncing around a lot, but Longfellow. Oh, Longfellow. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to that. Uh, I'm really not that dumb part of the time. Uh, anyway, uh, I got to think about three other things. So Longfellow uh, heard about it and, and tried to make enough noise and about to do something about it. And he heard of the people that had been um, moved from their homes and they'd been broken up with their families and stuff. So he wrote this really beautiful little story about Evangeline. Evangeline was one was the lover or the sweetheart of a of a man, and they got split up and separated. And so they never got together. She was looking for him, and he was looking for her forever, because they had no phones and ways to to uh, contact each other or anyone. And, and they finally, she was a nurse and she was in a hospital uh, in Evangeline uh, in that part of Louisiana. 
and uh, she fa they found each other just as he was dying. He died in her arms dramatically. Mm. And there's an, a big oak tree called Evangel, an oak there in that town. And um, I know I was, when I was in New Orleans, I was doing a municipal bond issue uh, to build a courthouse right there by the tree. And um, the, uh, anyway, that's the story about Evangeline. And uh, it, it stuck. And they've named the parish. They call it parish. Instead of counties, they call them parishes. It came from the Catholic division or the geographical division. And uh, that's Evangeline Parish. And uh, so the, it's that, uh, Longfellow's poem was so poignant and so sad and so heart rending. Uh, it, it had a big effect in those days on urban people, but they couldn't do anything about it because English at that time were the most powerful military on earth. You know? Yeah, I thought it was a great story, especially when um, I heard it was Longfellow. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the only thing I ever heard of Longfellow was um, was a Paul Revere. <laughs> the midnight ride of Paul Revere. <laughs> you know, that was the only thing I heard he did. So it was, um, was kind of cool to see he had wrote something else. Um, let's see. Oh, your other book, Dawn's Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. know. Yeah, because, um, yeah, that's what I was saying. Um, not only did you write a cookbook, I want people to know that you're an author of other books also. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Uh and I should have pointed out um, to you guys out there listening and viewing, um, LD Sledge is super eclectic. That's why I like to refer to him. The guy's into all kinds of things, artwork, books, cooking, as you can see. Okay, he's back. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, now I want to tell you about this cookbook. You can find that Caucasian Delectables on uh, Amazon under Cajun Cookbooks. It's one of the best sellers up there now. So you can get that. And if you want to find a little more about it, just go to my website and it's uh, CajunCookingSecrets.com and you can read that. Okay, now about the other book. We'll put all the links up for you. Yeah, well, here are four of some of my books. Whoa. Yeah. Now, this, uh, this is a book I co-wrote with this man about how to hire people. How to Hire People. That's one book. Uh, and here is a book. You're in New Jersey, right? New York, Albany, yeah. Or New York? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a book that I wrote for Dr. Uh, Ernest Pecorero. He was a chiropractor who had an office in, I don't know anything about geographically where New Jersey is, but he had three uh multidisciplinary clinics in New York and two in uh, down Jersey two around your home okay oh. mm -hmm. and uh, this is a book he decided he wanted to become a he made a fortune with his <laughs> and, and 9 eleven destroyed two of them by the way oh. uh, so anyway what he did he is, this is called riches to Rag. Why celebrities and pro athletes go broke and how, what they can do about it. Well, I outlined, he wanted to become a manager for, for football, mm -hmm. footballers, because he knew they were just, <laughs> here's a kid that's at 19 to 20 years old that suddenly makes $10 million. You know, and I've got all these outlined how that they spend it all in a year, you know, and that type of thing. There's tons of them in there. Anyway, what his answer is, how to handle that. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned I'm coming up to Don's Revenge, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> now, there was another friend of mine who asked me to write a book for him, and this is about New Orleans called Erlen. And I just let it go. I just wrote it just out of the top of my head, whatever I wanted to write. I didn't. He said, I don't care what you write. I just really want a book. I said, okay, let it go. <laughs> and it's in New Orleans. And it's a pretty spooky book. Okay, ah. I'll come back to that. Now, this is a completely different. This is a, um, it's called Nimrod's Peril. It's a mm. uh, fantasy, total fantasy. There's nothing like it in terms of fantasy books. 
Here is a book called Command Influence. It's about a court martial that I defended and won when I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, in the Army. And uh, it talks about all of the stuff that went down in uh, me fighting the Army to win that case. Wow. I, it was like in the Army, if you, def if you get somebody off in the case, uh, everybody's wrong. Because whenever the charges are made by the captain, who's the in, uh, commanding officer for this guy, he doesn't do it unless he feels like it's convict. Okay, mm -hmm. and then it goes up to the battalion commander, and it goes up there, and it goes on up to the general. The general looks at it, and he says, you say it's okay? That's okay. We're going to go with it. We'll, we'll, bring, we'll, we'll put him in court. And they come to my office, and the staff judge advocate office, and the staff judge advocate said, y'all right. You're all right. But then you come along and I get him acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, those boys got their tail feathers burned and they didn't like me. Mm. I was getting one acquittal after the other because I didn't, you know, I was never politically correct. <laughs> now, this is Don's Revenge. Yeah. This is the one about the. Um, <sighs> There's a lawyer living in, in the French Quarter on Royal Street. He's got his office downstairs, and he's about 30 years old, and he's, and he's got office at his uh, uh, apartments upstairs. And he falls in love with this girl from Trinidad, and, and she's black and he's white, and, and they're in love with each other. He didn't, all of because of the race thing, he wasn't doing it, didn't want to get, but he was in love with her and she was in love with him. Anyway, what happened was that his housekeeper daughter, who's 15, uh, gets raped and murdered by the um, mental health people. They, they, what had happened was uh, they arrested her uh, for nothing, they put her in, in juvenile detention and kept her and then raped her and murdered her. And so he gets involved, and it's a chase all around Louisiana when the, the law is after him to get rid of him because he was investigated. Mm. So it's one of them. It's a cliffhanger all the way through. <laughs> Love it. We're yeah. going to see that on the big screen anytime soon? What's that? We're going to see that on the big screen anytime soon? I, I, I want it to be. Matter of fact, Edwin Edwards, who was the governor at that time, mm -hmm. loved this book so much. And then he wanted to uh, make it into a movie. And mm -hmm. uh, then that was, anyway, I was about that time I lost my son in a bicycle accident. And uh -huh. I kind of stopped Sorry. working on it. But anyway, he, he uh, was going to do something about it, move it, and to get, make it into a, a movie, mm -hmm. pull people in. He wanted, he said, that's the best book you're talking about little Cajun guy called Nuki Nakan. He was a funny Cajun. Nuki Nuki Nakan. I, I Nuki, Nuki Nakan. Nuki Nakan. <laughs> Nuki Nakan. Anyway, and then uh, Edwin <laughs> went to jail for eight years uh, for some racketeering thing. Ooh. He had been governor for 16 years. He was, he was in there for four and reelect and then out and back four and four. So he'd been a, a governor for a long time, you know, and he's controlled a lot of people, but he had done something bad. He did that, got in jail. Anyway, he came, he got out and um, about two years ago, and he died about a month ago. Oh, but anyway, that's that book. And so, you know, so I've, I've been, had my finger in a lot of stuff. You know? That's excellent. And you also do paintings. A yeah. matter of fact, I love your paintings. Been wanting to talk to you about that. Um, before I forget, you inspired me to do a few things already. One of them, perhaps write a book one day. The other one, your paintings. I look. I don't think I'll be able to do nearly as well as you. Your painting, people listening, um, viewing, 
LD, go check out. I'll put the link out there for you. Go check out LD Sledge's paintings. They are incredible. I kid you not. You guys know me. I'll mess around. His paintings, you got to see them for yourself. I can't describe them. Just go see them and stuff. LD, if you don't mind, let's get back to your cookbook because I know you said you primarily want to focus on a cookbook, and I understand. Now, another thing, too, I noticed that um, you gave um, a lot of acknowledgments to people. Anybody you'd like to give a shout out to? People, you know, gave you help with the book or anything like that. Well, there's one lady I've got to talk to or talk about more than anybody. Okay. Um, this lady is Maggie Graham. Mm -hmm. And she's a book designer. And she had written this, and it was in color. And it was, uh, I had written it and had a lot of pictures and a lot of things in there that are not in this book. And it was color, of course, and it was, and she, she said, let me help you. I says, okay. I said, I was willing, you know, ready to pay. <laughs> well, she worked on this book, I don't know how long and how hard, making sure that all of the copyright stuff is done, all of the legal stuff is done, and making sure I don't get hung up. I mean, she was so meticulous about legal details, about, you know, even quoting someone. So mm. I, I had I had a lot of things in here that she said you can get in trouble with that. I had to take it out, mm -hmm. uh, and and she found pictures and she filled in holes and stuff. Everybody needs to have an angel like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it would have been a good book, I think. But she turned like I told her. I said you've turned this. Uh, pumpkin into a golden carriage. Mm, understood. <laughs> <clears throat> that's yeah, good, did. yeah. yeah hey, that's what I said, no man's an island unto himself, you know, so we all need, you know, somebody to help us out some kind of way. That's cool. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I offered to pay her and give her a percentage. She says, that's not why I did it. Because, you know, I got all this stuff and I got paintings, I've got music and I've done stuff. And she says, I wanted to give you a legacy. And this is, I consider this is my legacy as much as anything I've done. And at 86, you kind of hope and you left a track behind you that somebody can walk in or like, it, you know, mm -hmm. that's one thing. And I, uh, you know, I'm going to still be around because, you know, the people nowadays are living a long time. Mm -hmm. And the nursing homes that I'm playing for, it's nothing to have somebody in there that's 100 years old. Ooh. Yeah. Gives me I'm hope. Still, I'm still dangerous, and I'm still <laughs> badass. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. And that's out. Now, um, pertaining to the book, before we get um, away from your cookbook again, is there um, anything in particular that you wanted to speak about the book? that I may not have mentioned we haven't covered so far. Oh, goodness. It's, it's such a, a universe in this book of so many different things that I touched exactly. on that ought, ought, ought to be known. Mm -hmm. Well, like, you know, Cajuns, they, uh, well, it's like, uh, they, they really make fun of each other, you know? That's a real high tone thing if you can make fun of each other, you know? And, and other people, too, make fun of you. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Like Boudreaux mm -hmm. and Tibido. There's Boudreaux Tibido jokes all the time, you know, about these two characters, you know. And so Boudreaux himself, he got himself a new dog. Mm -hmm. And so Tibido said, hey, Boudreaux, where you got that dog at? He says, I got it from a wife. He says, hey, damn, you got a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love it. Good nature, people. Fun loving. Yeah, really. Yeah, I wanted, the reason I wrote it, because I, I wanted to people to uh, to know about the Cajuns. And, and uh, so I'm hoping that, that I can, because what they did, they had such a rough time. You see, back in 1950, Mm -hmm. No, 1912. Okay. They, uh, 
a law was passed making it against the law to speak Cajun in school. And the children coming to school couldn't speak nothing but eight, but Cajun. Right. And so they were punished and they were put down and squashed and invalidated. See. And then finally, the law changed in 1958, uh, and now they tried to recover. But during that time, uh, the, the, that invalidation plus the invalidation of when these guys had never been ne walked outside. See, Lewis, the Cajun country is something I didn't mention. It's something that should be maybe known. Um, they have they lived in this space that to the north is called Le Grand Bois, which is nothing but forest and woods mm -hmm. for miles and miles and miles, hundred miles, you know. To the to the uh, east is a big swamp, the Chafalaya Basin, and there was no way to cross that one or go through the woods. To the south is the Gulf. To the east, uh, to the west, is about two, three hundred miles of just nothing but prairie and stuff into Texas. So they lived in that section all by themselves. So they didn't learn any other English at all because they felt like that the Americans were about as bad as the English. You know? right. And here these poor guys, the young men, got drafted into the war. They couldn't, and they were made fun of because they couldn't, they'd never seen running water. They'd never seen, uh, you know, electricity. And it was like they were like primitives in a way. They were not. They were smart as me and you. They just had a hard time. And so they were made so much fun of uh, that they came back and they didn't permit their children to speak French. And it nearly destroyed the culture. Mm -hmm. Now, they had, they're getting it back. They're trying. It's a rough time. I had a law clerk one time. Uh, Randy Whatley, who lived there, he he was teaching a, a course in uh, at LSU in Cajun French, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me a lot of really interesting things. And, and I think he was even writing a book. And I think they've got some books now that, that tra sort of translated. Tell me one thing interesting. He said that the Cajun has nine days in every week. Mm -hmm. He says they got like the five days that they work, and then they got Saturday, and they go take care of their business at town downtown, and then Saturday night they dance. Sunday morning they go to mass, and Sunday evening they go visit friends and dance, yeah. and and that's nine days. <laughs> wow. I've got it not in the nine days. Dance, they love to dance. Mm -hmm. There's a section in the book here by a fellow by the name of Patan, and he's, his family has owned this, uh, this bar and uh, dance hall uh, for, golly, I don't know, 100 years. It's called La Poussière. <coughs> La Poussière. Mm -hmm. It means the dust. And it was by a gravel road. And of course, dust coming in, but also when they'd be dancing, it's so vigorous, the floor would give and the dust would come up through the cracks. And at first, when I first heard of La Poussière, it was back, golly, in the, in the, about 1955. And I went there with a friend and it, it took me there and, and, uh, and danced. I, I didn't dance that time. Uh, and there was, uh, that Cajun band was cooking. It was rocking. That floor was rocking. And uh, there was a dog came and sat down right next to my table. And, and then he went out the back door. It was that way, you know. Yeah. And uh, then here's this woman grabbed me and she says, this. I said, I don't know how. She says, come on. And she dragged me out on the floor and I was dancing. And you better dance because you get run over. It was like a traffic jam. Wow. It'd all go in a circle. It'd go round and round. And and the people moving like that. Everybody, and it's somebody 70, 80 years old dancing, he, he'd knock you down. Mm -hmm. he got business to do. he exactly. got to dance, man. <laughs> I love it.
Yeah. That's excellent. And just uh, LD, you um said you um perform and um you know music and you said you go to various nursing homes and stuff. You mind talking about that a little bit? And what type of music do you perform for the people? Well, I <laughs> Uh, golly, I hadn't thought about this thing here, but it was like back uh, when I was in high school, we didn't have music or art or anything in my school, but I wanted to do something. And Mama had a had a little Victrola with some records. And I, I impersonated, I learned to impersonate uh, singers. Mm -hmm. I impersonated Vaughn Monroe, uh, the Ink Spots, remember? Yeah, I, I could kick it up high, you know, and I had about six others and I put together a speech and I was in my speech, I had a speech class and my uh, teacher was uh, getting his degrees in it. And, and we would go to these speech tournaments at different mm -hmm. schools. And I won first place in after dinner speaking every time for two years. Uh, I, I'd impersonate those singers and I would mix in the story about stuff, you know, right. and, and I did that. And I always liked to perform. And uh, about, when is this? About 10 years ago, I did, I performed in 2011, 2012. Uh, and not on Broadway, there were two, um, there was two years separate productions completely, but each production was done two or three times. And I was the lead. Uh, uh, I was the lead. I am singing and danced a little bit, believe it or not. <laughs> and there were some really good singers and really good dancers. I had cancer back um, in 2015. Oh, sorry. And I went to MD Anderson uh, Cancer Clinic in a uh, big hospital in Houston. Mm -hmm. And they gave me proton radiation, which like the, it's like a pinpointed radiation. Mm -hmm. They shoot the squirrel, they don't shoot the neighborhood. And uh, I had got rid of it. And, and, but it, it got oh, my wow. voice. Thank God, that's great. It got my voice. I, I did, I, I sang at a little event the other day and played piano with something I did here, but mm -hmm. uh, I've had to relearn how to do that. Understood. Anyway, I've, I've, yeah, I love doing that. I wish I could have the voice back and I could do that more. Um, now, so, I know, thank you for sharing that. It says, uh, um, like back to your book, because I know you want to talk about the cookbook some more. And um, another thing, too, um, let me see how we're doing on time. And the great thing about it, I don't have my clock so I can see it, but I see yours. <laughs> that works good. And I don't want to take up any more of your time. No, I, I ain't got that? anything but this. Time, okay. You know? So is there anything else that you want to talk about or any parting words for people? Um, maybe some words of inspiration, you know? Or, um, well, I can tell you this, mm -hmm. that, that I do know, uh, you know, I see a lot of people my age and younger mm -hmm. have just quit, you know, they don't, they've lost it. And I can tell you, for an example, there's a woman, and I try to do this all the time, it, to keep you alive and keep you cooking and keep you doing stuff. I was writing a book for a person uh, that hired me to write a book and it never got published, but it's something I've learned a lot. There was a uh, Tibetan monk who was, he, she had adopted him. He was 80 something. And she, he came and lived at her house and he'd moved back and forth all throughout the country talking about Tibet because mm -hmm. he had been the, uh, biographer and the close confidant of the Dalai Lama. Mm. And they had more or less left Tibet at the same time when the Japanese moved, Chinese moved in there. And um, so I learned that what you do is that you, the Dalai Lama's main lesson is that you treat people with kindness and compassion, understanding. My viewpoint about that, everybody's got a bag of rocks to carry around. Mm. And that bag of rocks causes them to do things that are not 
in their interests or the interests of the people. And so knowing that, that everybody's got that, you got to understand them. And if you can help them take a block out, or you can at least help them care of that, that's something. So whenever I am at the cash register at Walmart or wherever I am, I will say something nice to them and I'll not just kiss their, you know, whatever. I'll mm -hmm. just say something nice and get a little conversation going. This last, uh, I think the last time I went to Walmart, I told that girl there how to cook green beans. <laughs> <laughs> I was there because I had my green beans. I said, you know how to cook them? And she said, no. And we went through the process. And she stopped bringing me up. And everybody, she got the end of the lesson. But that's what you do, you know? And, and you help people. And so you always understand them. And I, I've learned that if you got something to do and a reason to do it, you, you'll have a reason to do it. And you got to always look at the picture of where you're at and understand that you are in control of yourself. You can't lose control of yourself. You have the power of what I call a postulate. It's a post. You put it there. It's a truth. It's a decision. My decision is every day I get up and I say, Something beautiful is going to happen today. Something fantastic is going to happen today. Mm -hmm. And I even written it in a little book. I, I say that. And it happens. Wow. It does. I met you. Oh. It's been fantastic. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, but the other way around. I was like, wow, I met you. Man. Anyway, that's enough preaching. I just my own philosophy. That was yeah. beautiful. And thank you for the kind word. Um, yeah, like I said, um, it's about that time. Um, okay. But before you go, hang around and um, say goodbye to everybody. Do the closing, we call it, and stuff. Um, everybody, you know how it is and stuff. You know, good times and stuff. You know, time goes fast and stuff. Anyway, um, LD, Sledge, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody out there, thank you guys for joining the podcast. Be sure to check out LD Sledge and his cookbook, Cajun Delectables. That's 100 family recipes. And that's by LD Sledge, a native son. And he also has a whole bunch of other stuff, music. Um, then we also have um, artwork. I'm going to put all of the links in the description so you guys can check out um, LD Sledge's work. Another thing, don't forget, guys, the Yambar podcast. Um, we have our, our previous Yampar podcast guests. Make sure you go check those guys out and stuff, and ladies too. And also, never ever forget that the Yambar podcast is the place where you make it happen. Once again, my name is Brian Barcelo here with LD Sledge. <laughs> Peace, everybody. Thank you for joining us.